Hello and welcome to the next in my series of lessons about system software. Today we're going to look at some of the key functions of an operating system, namely multitasking and memory management. So multitasking. As you know, when we're using a computer, we'll often have lots of apps open at once. You might be listening to music on Spotify while you work on an essay in Microsoft Word, and at the same time your antivirus program is doing a scan in the background. You're running lots of programs at the same time. However, originally computers could only do one process at a time because they only had one CPU with one core. Remember, a single core CPU could only process one instruction at a time. Even today's modern computers with multi-core processors will have far more processes running at once than they have cores. So in the example here, we're running a word processor, an email program, a web browser, and an antivirus. That's four applications, even though we've only got a dual core CPU, which means it can process two instructions at once. So how do we run four or eight or 16 apps on a dual core system or even an older single core system? Well, this is what we call multitasking. This is a feature of our operating system that allows us to run lots of applications at the same time. So the definition here that you should memorize is multitasking is running multiple applications at the same time by giving each application a small time slice of processor time. Oops, there's a little spelling mistake there. Of course, that should be slice. Sad face teacher. Multitasking operating systems allow several processes to be resident in RAM at any one time. So that's what we can see here. We've, run, we've been running lots of different applications and they've all been transferred from our secondary storage, for example, our hard disk, into our main memory, our RAM. The operating system then arranges for these processes in memory to run in the CPU once they're ready, switching processes from different applications to keep them all up to date. Since a modern CPU is able to process billions of instructions per second, this process of switching between the applications is not apparent to the person using the computer. So for example, process four is running in the CPU. A few fractions of a second later, we can switch to process one, then process three, then process five, then back to process four again. So we're just switching them from the RAM to the CPU for a few small fractions of a second, then transferring them back into RAM and transferring the next process. And we're switching constantly between processing processes billions of times a second. So even though in this case, we can only run one process at a time, because we're switching between them so quickly, to a user, it looks like we're running lots of applications at the same time, even though we really aren't. If a process that is running is terminated because its allocated time has run out or is interrupted by an external event, the CPU can now turn its attention to another runnable process. So again, if you close down the application or something like that, the operating system knows to switch the next process in. Processes that are waiting have to wait for a signal to set them to be runnable before they can be dealt with. So if you think about that, all the applications want to run, they all want the processor time, but your operating system is kind of like a bouncer at a nightclub. It stops the processes that aren't so important, lets the more important processes in, and make sure the time is divided evenly between all the processes. And if you think about it, it makes sense to keep the CPU as busy as possible to get the most out of your computer system. If the current programming is loading data from, say, a slow peripheral device, rather than allowing the CPU to stand idle, it will turn its attention to another process. Or another way, if you're running Microsoft Word and you press print, it's going to take a few seconds to get processed. While all that's being done, while you're waiting for the printout to come through, it makes sense to be looking after other processes keeping busy, waiting for the slow peripheral device to get processed. 
On the subject of multitasking, you've got the idea of a multi-user operating system. So on larger computer systems, many users can log in and use a computer simultaneously. So here, maybe we've got a more powerful computer system and we're using that and sharing it with lots of other users or accessing the same resources. So this is like a more advanced form of multitasking because not only is the computer switching between different processes, it's also switching between different users. All the users think they have undivided time with the computer, but they're all only getting a few fractions of a second and then it's swapping to the next user and the next user. So in this case, the operating system is responsible for allocating access to memory, storage and CPU time for a number of users simultaneously. And again, this is taking advantage of the fact that modern CPUs can perform billions of calculations a second. So you can divide up time neatly between many users and many programs without anybody actually being aware that's what you're doing. Connected to multitasking, is the idea of memory management. And this is one of, the key one of the key roles for any operating system. It's got to be able to manage the available memory to manage the RAM. Again, we've got a definition here that you can memorize. Memory management is the organization of memory at a system level. It is used to allocate free memory to programs that need it and free up memory where it is not needed. The primary memory will contain all the programs and data currently in use. So all the programs that you're running, all the data those programs are running has to be resident in your RAM. The operating system has to make sure that the programs and data are stored safely and efficiently. Each program will have its own data and the operating system makes sure that no other program can change the data for another program without permission. So if you look at the diagram here, we've got a simplified diagram of RAM. You can see the operating system is taking up a fairly big chunk of memory. We've got three processes that are running and we've got some free space at the end. The operating system has to remember, has to allocate how much RAM each process has. It has to remember what the addresses are. It has to be able to increase or decrease the size of this depending on the needs of the process. And it has to make sure that one process doesn't overwrite another process, which could cause things to crash. It's also got to stop one process from being able to access the date of another process without permission, permission, because this is when you get problems with malware and viruses and things like that. Older operating systems didn't have very good memory management. They would crash a lot. Rogue programs, rogue processes could overwrite, overwrite and change the data of other programs and cause all kinds of problems. But nowadays, modern operating systems are much better at managing this memory, and this means they crash a lot less. So again, an example here, when running a spreadsheet program, your computer memory is used to store the spreadsheet program store your spreadsheet file, store a copy of the image that is being displayed on the monitor and run the operating system. So all that has to be resident in RAM and this all has to be looked after by your operating system. Several programs will be resident in memory at one time. Some will stop and the space they occupied will be freed and others will take their place. So again, that's just thinking about how you use your computer. You start applications, you finish applications, that memory space has to be continuously recycled to make sure everything is used efficiently. And this is what your operating system is managing. At the GCSE level, you need to know two different ways an operating system can manage memory. And you only have to know them in brief detail. This is what we call segmentation and paging. So we'll just look at them to finish off this lecture. Segmentation is simply splitting block programs into blocks to fit the available gaps in memory. This is what we use in RAM. This is what your operating system uses in RAM. So let's have a look at an example. We've got three programs in memory, A, B, and C. And you can see we've got A, we've got B, we've got C, and we've got some free memory space here. However, the user closes down application B, and that's removed from memory. So now that we have two sections of free memory space, we want to run 
application D. However, there's not enough space for an either of the memory blocks. But what we can do now is that the operating system splits D between the two gaps. And between these two gaps, we have enough space to run application D. And again, application D doesn't know that it's being split between two blocks in RAM. Your operating, sy operating system is managing all this and handling it all in the background seamlessly. Paging, however, is a different system. The operating system can split all programs into equally sized pages, typically several kilobytes, and keeps track of all these pages in a table. And this is what we use for virtual memory. So if you don't remember what virtual memory is, this is when you start running out of physical RAM and your operating system takes a part of your secondary storage, whether that's your SSD or your hard disk drive, and treats it as if it's RAM. So it's actually storing running programs on the secondary storage and acting like it's RAM in order to keep your programs all running. However, virtual memory is slower than using actual physical RAM. So if you're using too much virtual memory, it can slow down your system. So superficially, segmentation and paging might seem quite similar. However, segmentation, the blocks are flexible. The blocks of memory, these segments are flexible. They can vary depending on the needs of the processes running. However, paging, these blocks are fixed. Okay, the pages are already set up. They're probably several kilobytes in size and the pages are all fixed. So segmentation, the blocks of memory are flexible. We use segmentation with RAM. With paging, the blocks are a fixed sized and we use this for virtual memory. Okay, I think that's probably enough to go through in one go. In the next lesson, we'll look at some more features of operating systems. We'll look at things like user management and file management. But until then, take care and good luck with your studies.